My name is Shannon Kelly. I'm Head of Public Programs for the Archive, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this latest uh, event in our ongoing series, Through Indian Eyes, Native American Cinema, um, a program that we have uh, been engaged with since the beginning of October and will be taking place uh, until the middle of December when we, uh, we, we finally eclipse this year's worth of programming at the Archive. Um, and one of the proudest and happiest things that we've done uh, all this year in that it represents for us, you know, a continuum of the work that we do anyway, celebrating excellence in cinema, but also um, a time of discovery for us and a little bit of catching up because in as much as we have been presenting a 25-year history, um, it's one, uh, the, uh, the, the parts of which we have rarely uh, uh, been involved in the past in any of our, in any of our previous programming. And as we undertook this research, it became clear to us that there's plenty of work left to be done. We, we sampled about 600 works from, uh, from an entire body of work representing uh, filmmakers' output from the territories we now call the United States and Canada, uh, in numbers of about 600, but, um, but there were so many more just in that, uh, in that area and over the 25-year history that we were studying. And of course, so many uh, indigenous kinds of work that are being done and many times in communication across national borders in Mexico, um, in Australia, New Zealand, and, and other places around the world, that there's plenty of work left for the archive to do, and it just represents a joyful prospect to us. Um, we are so very happy today to be joined by a distinguished panel to discuss um, uh, a really interesting topic, and that is uh, the, uh, the um, well, the, a sort of a comparison between the cultural riches that we've been looking at and the challenges and opportunities that exist by way of seeing that these riches are offered to a larger public on the big screen, and that those expressions of Native American and First Nations identity and experience um, get to be done so on the good authority of Native American and First Nations makers and then presented to a wider public. Uh, this is something I think that all of us on stage believe in and, and you know, hope we, that we see more and more over time, but we also acknowledge challenges and, uh, and a history um, well, albeit we, we did a 25-year history, we might have you know, spoken of the century's worth of Native American images that have been offered by Hollywood that are of a very different kind than the kind we're talking about today. Um, things that actually are historically grounded, culturally sensitive, and expressions of Native people themselves and offered to the larger public of which you know, we're all part of now the same human journey. Um, but we do have the opportunity in being together to kind of share our best ideas about these subjects. And so I'm um, very happy to uh, be sharing this conversation with such a wonderful group of people. I'm going to crib a little bit because there's a lot to know and remember about uh, each of our guests. Uh, beginning on my very left with Mr. Mike Farrell. Um, he is known and admired for his portrayal of Captain B.J. Honeycutt during an eight-year run on the CBS television series MASH. But Mike has been an actor for some 50 plus years with credits ranging from combat, Daniel Boone and Bonanza, to Law and Order and Desperate Housewives. With producing partner Martin Min Marvin Minoff, he formed Farrell Minoff Productions, going on to produce such acclaimed feature films as Dominic and Eugene, starring Tom Holson and Ray Liotta, and Patch Adams with Robin Williams, as well as movies made for television, including Memorial Day and Incident at Dark River. He has recently consulted on a project for Red Horse Native Productions concerning Native American human rights. Indeed, his activism around human rights and environmental causes are well known, and he is a frequent public speaker on matters of immigration, animal rights, and the rights of children, among other causes. Mike has recently been seen in the new Sundance Channel television series, The Red Road, which features a leading storyline involving the Ramapo Mountain Indians. Um, next up is Mr. Joe Bratcher. Um, Joe is a specialist in screenwriting and film production with a background in tap dancing, and so perhaps we'll learn a little bit more about this later. We'll see, have to see how our time goes. Uh, Joe has developed and taught courses in screenwriting for film and television under the auspices of UCLA's extension program, so go Bruins, uh, where he has created the first online distance screenwriting class in the country. He continues to mentor both professional and student writers, including presently the writer of a screenplay concerning the Trail of Tears, with writer-director Valerie Redhorse attached. He's also a professional manager of writers, um, and Joe works to bridge screenwriters' academic training with professional necessities and standards, a mission furthered with his initiative, the Twin Bridges Screenwriting Workshop, LA's longest-running and most successful literary salon. Um, we move next to Renee Haynes. 
Uh, she's a noted casting director and two-time Emmy nominee for the TNT DreamWorks miniseries Into the West and the HBO feature Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, for which she also received the Ardios Award for Excellence in Casting. She is recognized in the entertainment industry as one of the foremost experts in Native American and First Nations casting and consults on many projects, domestic and foreign. In 2014, she was Native casting consultant on the Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu feature film The Revenant and became attached to cast Soul Catcher based on the Frank Herbert novel, a project that's still in development. She is presently in prep to cast the Native roles in HBO's upcoming miniseries Lewis and Clark. A partial list of credits relevant to our discussion today includes films for television, such as Geronimo, Lakota Woman, Siege at Wounded Knee, Tecumseh, The Last Warrior, Crazy Horse, and Grand Avenue, as well as a number of films featured in this series, including Randy Redroad's The Doughboy, Chris Ayer's Smoke Signals and Edge of America, and Jeff Barnaby's Rhymes for Young Ghouls. To my right, Gail Ann Hurd is a prolific and multi-award winning producer of major release feature films, as well as documentaries and movies for television. Besides such indelible entries in the cultural canon as James Cameron's Aliens, The Terminator, and The Abyss, Michael Bay's Armageddon, also Dante's Peak. Why, why do we refer to these all from the director's perspective? <laughs> Indeed. Oh, well, <laughs> they're Galen Hurd's films as well. <laughs> Collaborations. Um, there was her production of The Water Dance, which was a 1992 Independent Spirit Award winner, and she is an awardee of the National Board of Review the Florida Film Festival, and New York Women in Film and Television, among others. In addition to these activities, which would keep any producer busy enough, she has lent her talent to documentary production. And in particular, we must mention True Whispers, the story of the Navajo Code Talkers, which will screen as part of tonight's feature program, and is a co-production with uh, Red Horse Native Productions, along with... Don't mention the director. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> along with the Choctaw Code Talkers. Um... Moving on to a uh, noted director, uh, Valerie Redhorse is a filmmaker of Cherokee ancestry and the owner and founder of Redhorse Native Productions. Her 1998 feature, Naturally Native, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival before its theatrical run, um, uh, was featured as part of this film series, as is True Whispers, which, as we mentioned, screens this evening. Valerie is presently preparing a documentary on Wilma Mankiller, the first female elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. With you with Gail. Um, this is true. Uh, Red Horse is the online host for Casino Enterprise Management's live talk show, Native American Gaming, where she, com she combines her multiple cross-discipline cross knowledge and skills. Her collaborations have included projects funded by or working with the Pequot uh, Tribal Nation, the Navajo Nation, the Powhatan Renape Nation, the Chumash Band of Mission Indians, the Viejas Band of Kumeyaay, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. She is also a co-curator of this series. And finally, to my very right, Dawn Jackson. I'm scrolling, Dawn. Um, for two decades, has been a leader in Nav Native American community and communication initiatives, both locally and nationally, working within and sometimes creating organizations to promote opportunities and recognition for Native people interested in pursuing careers in entertainment. These include the American Indian Registry for the Performing Arts, the American Indian National Center for TV and Film, the FNX TV, American Indian Scholarship Fund of Southern California, Red Horse Native Productions, and First Americans in the Arts, which she co-founded in 1992 and where she still serves as board co-chair. A longtime elected Los Angeles City and County Commissioner on Indian Affairs, Dawn has also held many positions within the Walt Disney Company over the past 20 years, including media producer, product designer, cultural consultant, and a member of the team on Global Women's Initiatives. She's an enrolled member of the Saginaw Chippewa Tribe of Michigan and served as a co-curator co -curator of our own UCLA film and television archive film series through Indian Eyes Native American Cinema, which brings us all together today. So welcome to you all. And um, with such riches uh, to work from, it's difficult to know where to begin except that I note that, uh, Valerie, you find yourself at the crossroads of many of these conversations um, all of the time as a director, producer, um, and a person who's uh, drawn together, you know, other people in, in networks and projects. And I wonder um, if um, you would like to sort of g give a sense of the big picture as you see it, you know, your perspective from this standpoint, you know, a person interested in the achievements and the uh, possibilities for a community and also for your own as an artist. 
Sure. Um, so first, I want to say thank you for coming today. I know it's a Sunday afternoon and there's a lot going on before Thanksgiving. I think it is an important discussion. Um, and I also want to say thank you to our sponsors. Um, that was really an important part of our community. We had two tribal sponsors as well as the Hollywood Foreign Press. We had San Manuel Band of Mission Indians as well as, Don, help me with the pronunciation, Yocha, Yocha Dihi um, uh, from up north. So very, um, we're very grateful to those two tribal nations who saw the importance of this program. Um, I also want to th say thank you to the panelists. Uh, as you heard in that introduction, a lot of them have intersected uh, with my production company and my career and have been a, a tremendous help. And as Shannon was doing the uh, introductions, I thought, boy, the panelists up here, we could make one tremendous film if we work together. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> but um, basically, how this panel sort of came to be, you'll notice that other than myself and Don, this is not necessarily a Native American panel, and that's on purpose, because we noted that of the, well, we looked at over 600 films for this program, and we were thrilled that we found 600 films directed by Native Americans, but what we noticed that was concerning is most of them did not have mainstream distribution. Um, Smoke Signals, of course, did, and a few others, but most of them, it was very hard to find the filmmaker, uh, to even find a copy of the film sometimes was difficult. One of them didn't have all the rights in place, so we couldn't even show it. So we definitely saw this gap in like the business side, not the creative side, because many of the films were tremendous. Um, the films got made, and many of them were obviously very good, but then there was this um, disparity, what we saw from other communities, even though they were independent films, and other communities have a lot of independent films as well, we just didn't see that exposure. Whether uh, We weren't looking for films to necessarily be big studio blockbusters, but they, s they didn't even have sort of basic distribution or DVD sell-through, and um, we're questioning, like, why is that? Why is the Native American film voice not being heard, not being seen uh, the way other films are and, and uh, other communities are? You know, what is the problem? And more importantly, what are the solutions? So we gather together people who are in the business, who have the experience and the knowledge as working in on the, some of them have obviously worked in front of the camera here, but for the most part, we're looking at the behind the camera, um, the, the body of Hollywood as it were, whether it's independent film or studio film, that whole network that determines if a film gets seen and heard. You know, wh what, what are the solutions for native filmmakers there just seems to be this lack of access to this barrier challenge to getting those films out there. And we're trying to come up, hopefully, with some you know, discussion and dialogue that can point us in the future to more of a partnership, perhaps, uh, working with um, you know, joint ventures, uh, with the guilds, with the resources. You know, I don't have all the answers. And, and uh, the reason this is not a panel of Native American filmmakers is because we didn't want the panel to be just about, oh, here's all the problems. I think we know what the problems are. We're trying to find the solutions. So today, um, Mike and Joe and Renee and Gail are going to find all the solutions for <laughs> this particular <laughs> issue. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to kick it back um, to Shannon and uh, let him take it from here. Um, I'd like to go uh, immediately next to Gail, actually, and say how you know grateful we are that our series is enriched by, you know, um, such a great contribution as True Whispers, which is screening this evening, and um, you know how happy we are that your commitment has included, you know, that you have made room for um, for work like this, which you know, once finished, one can see is a beautiful and a compelling story, um, all those things that one wants in a, in a film of importance and so forth, um, and uh, and there may even be very personal reasons why you know this particular film or a project of this kind would be important to you. But um, so many more people could do such things and do not, um, you know, in, in their time when, when, in fact, there's a lot of important work to be done just around the very high profile, internationally known, high profit, fast moving um, sort of films that Hollywood is best known for. And um, from your perspective, how uh, common a thing might this be in the, in the medium to very long term that we would begin to see that these are compelling American stories too and, and begin to uh, more regularly see um, producers of importance within the establishment lending their services to such projects? 
Um, I think the the important term there is lending, <laughs> because it certainly isn't isn't it, it isn't a, a very profitable business. Um, but just to, to dial back to how I became involved, I became involved because as a member of the Nickel Screenwriting Fellowship Committee at the Motion Picture Academy uh, for many, many years, since I believe um, 1989, uh, what we do is we award fellowships uh, to, to aspiring writers. And uh, one of the scripts that I read um, was, um, was Native, it was, it was about the Navajo Code Talkers, and it was almost entirely a Native American cast. And uh, so I optioned the rights, and I thought, this is a great story. Well, of course I'll get financing. Uh, well, it turns out um, it wasn't quite so easy to get financing, especially when John Woo decided to tell, um, to, to make a movie called Wind Talkers, which from what we could gather is actually, has no truth in the story whatsoever, and in fact made it seem as if the Marine Corps uh, looked at the the Navajo as potentially cowards and people who would who would um, if captured um, give up the code, which if you know the Navajo absolutely would never have happened. Um, so so actually, did I contact? I talked. To, I contacted Don first. Brianna, yeah. yeah, through a friend of mine, Brian Westcott, who is an Inuit uh, who worked on Dante's Peak, and I said, look, I think it's very important. To have native voices involved in this, I mean, you know, I, I I don't want to be the, you know, the um, sort of have the continue to have the the white, um, the the Anglo perspective on something that I think has to be very sensitive and really should be the Navajo story, um, and uh, so we we all got together and uh, decided that we needed to do. Um, to to approach the the Navajo. Anyway, I won't go into the whole backstory, but. What we realized when we went to to Window Rock um, and uh, and met with the met with the tribe and met with the the, Nav the Code Talkers Association was that if we didn't tell their story, and especially if we didn't do a documentary, they would all be gone. And at this point, they may all be gone. They've all passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and we had to do it now. Um, you know, the movie the movie could potentially happen, but if we didn't tell the documentary, that story would not be told, essentially from their perspective in their wor words. And, uh, and we were also very lucky because at the time working at my company is someone who's very well associated with uh, UCLA, Barbara Boyle. And Barbara has never heard the word no or impossible. And she basically said, I'm gonna get you the money. And uh, so we actually applied for a grant through ITVS. But at that point we also knew that it was better to get the film made and out there than it was to say, oh, we're only going to do a feature. Um, and so what I'd like to contribute to this is that, um, that the marketplace is changing, and it's changing rapidly for feature films. Uh, everyone is, is facing, um, is facing a, a change where you, there is no distinguishing now between the big screen, the small screen, and, st and streaming. The key thing is communicating uh, that you have something worth seeing to an audience. And so to me, it's really getting the word out. It doesn't really matter what medium it takes. Um, and um, you know, so, so I think that more collective effort and energy that goes into that, which is identifying audiences. I mean, the, you know, obviously Amazon and Netflix and you know, you name it, uh, have algorithms to find people who are potentially interested. So if we can, if we can find a way to to get access to algorithms that will help us find the audience of people who are already potentially interested, um, it's a win-win. And it that that also could contain implicitly the answer to my next question, but which is about though a a, a film about a compelling story and so forth may find its audience just because you know maybe the the, the barriers to entry in this way are, are much lower than they used to be. Um, is it also um, true to such an extent that an individual filmmaker um, may find it more possible to sustain a career and build a name and so forth? A absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the one thing we hear over and over again um, is branding. 
and you know Spike Lee has a brand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously major corporations have brands, but once you develop a following, I, I, I got a tutorial which we'll all be talking about very soon uh, in terms of uh, funding Wilma, uh, the man killer, the story of Wilma Mankiller, uh, about Kickstarter. And the remarkable thing there is you build an audience and, um, and the people who donate to your, to your, um, to your funding uh, have a vested interest and they tell their friends. And it, that's how you develop, um, develop the kind of following that can get it to the, to the next level. Um, but uh, this is all very new to me. So uh, there are people who are far better versed in it than I am, but I'm learning. Um, I was interested to ask you, Renee, about um, the, the long time during casting and casting um, um, projects of importance. So long, in fact, that the character and the profile of these projects changes greatly from the time of Dances with Wolves straight to um, Jeff Barnaby's Rhymes for Young Ghouls, which we screened this year, which is a First Nations project by a First Nations guy um, a very, and a very sort of countercultural, uh, you know, also um, uh, genre piece, very angry and uh, edgy and so forth. And, um, and uh, your commitment has stayed strong throughout all that, but also the, the, it seems like the, the terrain has been shifting a lot. And uh, you also work in different national contexts. And <laughs> you, you mean other than native projects? Well, sure, but also outside of the United States oh, and even yes. in other languages. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think what it really boils down to for me is I really love what I do. I love these projects. I love these filmmakers. Um, the, this, the interesting thing with going way back with Dances with Wolves, we were just making a little movie that we hoped somebody would like. And, and it sort of started a renaissance a bit. Um, but then when you fast forward to Rhymes for Young Ghouls and Jeff Barnaby, it's interesting that because he is a uh, Aboriginal filmmaker in Canada, the funding is there for him. The, 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 the landscape that hasn't changed in all these years through Smoke Signals and through all of these other films is that the funding isn't there for American Indian projects in the US. Uh, the thing that I run into all the time, not just with um, native filmmakers, but with um, non-native filmmakers who have a great story uh, with native content and native leads, is that if they don't attach a name actor in some other role, then they don't get their funding. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, regarding Kickstarter, I just did a film last uh, two years ago, I think, called Winter in the Blood, which is a beautiful, beautiful movie. And that movie would never have been made had it not been for Kickstarter. Those filmmakers raised every dime that they spent in Montana where they shot the movie. And let's hope it gets, I think it did just recently get distribution, but there again, it's um, non-native filmmakers, native content, native writer, native um, source material, but it's a hard question. Yeah, it's a, well, I guess things are not all changing all at the same time, but. Um, the thing that is changing is that there are so many wonderful young native filmmakers that are coming up that have stories to tell. And um, the fact that there is an easier platform and an easier way for them to um, bring their films to the marketplace is changing. It's just that they're not getting the funding to make those films to bring them to the marketplace. But to something to, to think about is that it, this is facing, I, I think that the statistic was that 80% of films that screen at Sundance, which essentially you know, is considered the best of the best mm -hmm. of independent cinema, do not get distribution. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a more global issue in the United States. Um, there is something about the, you know, the way one used to think of going to see a native-themed film at the Friday, mm -hmm. and I could be speaking entirely for myself, but just remembering conversations and so forth, is that this is kind of a special thing you were undertaking to do something might be good for you as well as entertaining, you know what I mean? 
And um, nowadays, uh, more and more when we see a film um, gain traction at a Sundance or in a setting like this, it may be more just because it took you by surprise. There was something about it um, very new and um, uh, th that very much feels that that's, it's of today and maybe also of the world that you already know. Um, yeah, it's a fresh voice that people haven't been exposed to, I think. But you're partly having to do with maybe that uh, occasionally it's coming from a native director where it was, this wasn't always the case, and maybe also someone young um, who's, you know, whose life isn't the one that was depicted uh, 20 and 30 years ago, but right. is talking about Correct. a new world. Um, Joe, I was interested to speak with you a little bit about your uh, work in in coaching writers and so forth in uh, enunciating, you know, the, the particular place that they may be coming from and um, and doing so in a way that would gain traction and kind of gain um, 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 sort of sort of feasibility in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, in fact, I was asked to be on the panel, and I called Hal immediately, and I said, why exactly are you asking me to be on the panel? Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> which was an important question, I thought. And she said, well, Joe, it, uh, it really does, you know, all kind of start with you and the blank page. And that's a fact. It starts with the story. It starts with the story. It, it, the, you know, the, the writers come to me, and they have this wonderful story, and they have this great passion, oftentimes an agenda, political, social, whatever. And then it's my job to remind them, and now to remind you, that it, these stories that you want your agenda or you, you want to educate people, whatever, it always has to do with one person's journey. If you can create a character, or there's a character historical, who that we can identify with, we can see how the environment uh, how he handles or she handles it, how they uh, how they move through this uh, this milieu that they're going through. Uh, that's the most important thing for me. It's it's um, it's it's all about that humanity of the main character, and, that, and we can see and we can feel. Uh, I have I do have an illustration um, with Valerie. Uh, we received a um, a script, and it was uh, ninety pages, and it was about Standing Bear. I don't know if you know this character. He was the first Native American to be treated as a human being in a court of law. That's a great idea. But he was first told he was not. No. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> You're not a human being. Oops, yes, yes, you are. In an American court of law. In an American court of law. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Thank God for this panel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and that's the backstory. And this, these were probably the worst 90 pages I'd ever read. Maybe well, ever. I didn't write them. No, 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 no. This was this was given. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, and and even worse, it, Standing Bear, the name of the character story, was told from the lawyer's point of view, the very white point of view of the lawyer. Well, we immediately you know pressed the button, and, and um, we started over, literally from page one, because it was such a wonderful story. It hadn't been told, and look how you know, how it resonates to today. So what I did, I went, one of my, one of my writers, his name is Ross Raventos, he took it and what he did was, he created a story about Standing Bear. What was it like to be Standing Bear in 1879 and to have to go through this? And a lot of research, um, putting Standing Bear first and the, uh, the uh, adventure and experiences that he was having how did they affect him? And, uh, well, it was, he, Ross went to uh, Nebraska, met with the Pompkins, did a lot of research, made friends, went to a sweat lodge, which he actually made it all the way through. And I think that helped him get credibility. And then after five or six iterations of that script, honing it down and honing it down, keeping the heart, you know, it's very important to keep the passion but it's Standing Bear's story, you know? And then Mike Farrell read it, and was kind enough and smart enough to come on board, and it just got better and better and better. And that's where we are today with it. But all this does is anything you do, remember, it's the story, it's, 
the education is the byproduct. The agenda that you want to get out there is the byproduct. If you have someone who goes through an arc and learns themselves in the moment, then the person watching it will learn and be entertained. And uh, so that's what I've been preaching for a lot of these 25 years. And uh, I, think it, I think it makes sense, you know? Uh, Mike, I was thinking today of uh, Dominic Eugene and Eugene, which I haven't seen in years, but it's always stayed with me um, as uh, a very special project was so sensitive and so much about marginal people whose stories just don't usually get told. First of all, they're marginalized by class and then by their family situation that the one brother is so dependent upon the other that if he's going to have sort of a, a, a life in society, it'll be because his brother stays with him and so forth. And um, then there's the fact that you speak so often on behalf of marginalized peoples and just, you know, about things that people, you know, it's hard to get a conversation started about. People sometimes don't want to talk about them. And I've seen you do that in the face of resistance to <laughs> on television um, quite a few times. And um, uh, I was wondering if you, uh, 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 about your feelings, about your commitments in, in, in your filmmaking um, to these kinds of things, that these are the films, seems like they're worth making, but, uh, but so often there may be you know, uh, a particular struggle or it may require particular inventiveness to um, get them started and keep them moving. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, the, the, a number of things uh, pertinent to the response to your question come to mind. You mentioned uh, human rights. I have been, um, I'm called an activist, not a term I particularly care for, but uh, nonetheless, I am active as a citizen of the United States in a position of some um, responsibility, I think, to, um, to try to see to it that um, human beings, all human beings, human rights are honored and respected, which is a situation that we actually aspire to but haven't achieved. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, unlike South Africa, for example, here in the United States, we've never had a truth and reconciliation process with the Native American. We've never had a truth and reconciliation process with the black community. Uh, we haven't, uh, the, the, the two uh, of the in, uh, ethnic communities in, our, in, in the amalgam that makes up this country that have been most grievously insulted by our manifest destiny, if you will. Um, so I think, I think there, is a, there has to be a reason to be involved. If you want to be involved in this business and make films because you want to get rich, uh, find something else to do. <laughs> um, if you want to get involved in this business um, because you want to convey something, that's, that's the ideal situation and, and people um, people make glorious, glorious pieces of, uh, I hesitate to use the term art, but in fact it becomes magical and therefore it becomes art. As a result of their conviction about some piece of, some person or some piece of information or some experience that the uh, illustration of which touches people's lives and helps them understand that such a thing is possible. So we, it seems to me, who are involved in this business have, uh, in my view, a responsibility to be um, faithful to the fundamental premise that all people have value. All human beings deserve to be treated with dignity and all human beings uh, are uh, worthy of honor, um, no matter their station. Um, you know, there are reasons that we come to these positions. Um, I have my own, but the fact is that uh, um, I identify very personally, very strongly with those who are uh, the victims of the powerful. Um, and I think that we have a, here in this, in the business that's being reflected on here, we have an extraordinary opportunity to right wrongs, to clarify uh, for people what, um, what is significant about being alive in this, in this world, in this life, what, what the purpose of our existence is. Forgive me for being so grand, but I, I, I do think that 
when you see a film and it moves you, that is a process that is humanizing. And when you see films that uh, insult you, that uh, appeal only to the base emotions and, and rage you uh, pointlessly, uh, I think it's quite the reverse. But film, whether it's television, as Gail said, whether it's television or it's streamed or it's motion picture on the big screen, film has this extraordinary capacity to um, enlighten, to move, enlighten, and therefore, th therefore uh, I think, uh, glorify the human and not just human, but the human and our compatriots on this planet uh, condition. Um, so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really an, 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 a calling uh, to be involved in films that make a difference or that try to make a difference, make a statement, and, uh, and to be, have been involved in the opportunity to, m to make some of those films or to be instrumental in the process has been a glorious uh, experience, but it's a very tough one uh, because those of us who care about the messages that are being put out are worried about the messages that are being put out in most film uh, because they uh, negate human possibility. Um, a fellow by the name of Sean Penn once said to me that, 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 that there are two kinds of films, the, the films that are, that are life-enhancing and the films that are life-denying. And um, one can question Sean's view of that and some of the films he's done, but for him, I think the, the point is a very real one, and I think it's, it's important for us to, uh, to keep that in mind. Why be part of something that is life-denying when so much of the world around us is life-denying? Um, so um, I narrated a documentary uh, uh, a couple of years back now called Valentino's Ghost. It's not one you'll see much because it doesn't get much exposure, but it's about the extraordinary arc uh, of the appreciation in our society of the Arab, who, who Valentino started as this sexy leading man um, uh, figure playing the sheik, uh, and the Arab today is the terrorist. So the, the work that has been done, or the damage that's been done to the image of that human being through the years of thoughtless, or in some cases thoughtful, uh, attempts to degrade a culture are an important lesson for us, it seems to me. Um, and th that film tries to tell that story. But the reverse really ought to be the case. We ought to be finding ways in which we can enhance the understanding of people to uh, the humanity of those people about whom we tell stories. And when stories like the one that came to Joe through um, Valerie, when stories about a, a human being of great strength and great personal authority and uh, a huge kind of uh, exemplar of what's possible in life um, comes to us, uh, then that story ought to be told, and it ought to be told on the big screen so that people out there can see and enjoy and learn and grow from the experience of it. Um, so those are the things, it seems to me, that uh, uh, for whatever reason uh, appeal to me. Uh, those are the things that I think appeal on some level to all of us, and uh, that uh, ought to be the films that are being made. So when I find something that exemplifies the story of a young man who was brain damaged as a result of, we, we find out at the end of the story, as a result of uh, child abuse, um, then I, I, I want that story to be made. And I go through the process necessary to find somebody who cares enough to put up the money to do it. Um, and, and you start, I think, from a, from a negative uh, because there are only so many people with the power to give you the money to do it, unless this new business of crowdfunding works. Um, and you come into a business where too many people don't give a damn what it is the film is about. All they want to know is, it's, is it going to make money? And they know that if they do copycat stuff, if they do cookie cutter stuff based on the premise of the last cookie cutter, uh, the, the prototype cookie cutter picture, um, that's what they'll be comfortable in doing. Um, 
what you have, I think, represented here are people who uh, don't want to play that game. What they want to do is tell stories that make a difference to the human race and, uh, and to the people that share the planet with us. And that's who we ought to be emulating. I have to I have to comment on a couple things because what you said is is so profound and and I think cuts right to the core of, of what we're talking about here. But um, the power of the media and the power of film is is so incredible and the influence. Um, one of the things that we were honored with on True Whispers, the Navajo Code Talkers were in the middle of a political campaign to receive their was it the Medal of Honor? The Congressional Gold Medal. Yeah, the Congressional Gold Medal. And they'd been fighting for this for years, and we're just, you know, it's a political process. You have to lobby the Senate and the House, and it's not that anyone was opposed to it, but it's still a very difficult political process. And they came to us as we had shot some of our film, and we weren't quite finished, and they said, can we put about a four or five minute clip of your film in congressional lobbying packets that we're going to pass out to everyone in the Senate and the Congress? And we said, of course. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting our film was the ultimate reason, but they got it after they did that. And so just to think that we were a part of that process is, is mind-boggling. As a filmmaker, um, I, I never thought in political terms. I was just making a film. We were just making a film to tell an amazing story. And then w when you take it a step further, there are so many political issues right now surrounding the Native American community. Um, and it doesn't really matter what side of the issue people fall on, whether it's gaming, the mascot issue, land rights. I mean, there's, there's, and this is something that I'm involved with in my life outside of filmmaking. But what I find is when there's ballot issues, and we just had one here in California. And again, I don't care if you're on a pro or a con side, but we find that non-Indian people are voting often based on their image of an Indian person in the media that is inaccurate because we just historically do not have accurate proper images because we are absent from this medium. You just don't see who we are and a lot of people still think of us in terms of old westerns or just inaccurate portrayals. So I think this is not a discussion that is unimportant. It, it is something that is essential um, that we tell these stories about who Native people are, and I agree with Mike um, that if you if you have that passion, you will tell the story. We'll find a way to get it done. Um, but I'm going to throw out a last kind of comment slash question for the panel um, on Standing Bear, the film that they've mentioned. That uh, actually Gail, Joe, and uh, Mike, we all looked at this. We all had a, a the same reaction that the story should be told. And I actually tried to pitch it a few times to American film production companies that claim to make films um, about the underdog and that had an interest. And I got a couple of, of feedback comments. Um, historical films don't make money, and it's a Native American film, so you wouldn't um, have a large enough audience to make money, meaning they thought it would only sell to Native Americans. Mm -hmm. So I feel that's just sort of a stereotype we fight in the industry. And I'd love to hear any comments from any of you. I, I just came back from Australia on Thursday and um, got to enjoy Thursday twice, uh, <laughs> as it turns <laughs> out, because you gain a day when you fly back. In fact, I landed before I left. Um, but while I was there, I met with uh, Aboriginal filmmakers, and I found out something. I'd already seen the film, but I didn't realize it was the biggest hit of 2013. Is a film that, if you haven't seen, you should check out, called The Sapphires. Um, the writer uh, is Aboriginal, and it's a story of his grandmother. And it was directed uh, by Wayne Blair, who's also um, Aboriginal. And there was no expectation when this film was financed, which, as Renee was saying, it was only financed because there are grants in Australia to independent Australian filmmakers, and even more grants available for the Aboriginal community. Um, and it became the number one grossing film, in, uh, Australian film, in Australia last year and made between 13 and $14 million. Um, so, you know, so clearly it was a universal story. It was a period piece. And it was almost entirely about, you know, this Aboriginal singing group. But it was, it was I, I, I challenge you to watch the film and not cry. I mean, it is... It is so powerful. It is power. Have you seen it? No. You really need to see this film called *The Sapphires*. And uh, you know, it, it, it's not one of those stories. You know, it's not a sequel to 
you know, to Star Wars or a prequel. Um, there are no special effects. It didn't cost very much money. But it is a human story that resonates. And, and that's the whole thing. I mean, great storytelling, the journey of the characters is what is front and center. And of course, the, the thing that, that I tend to respond to is ordinary people thrust into extraordinary circumstances and how they overcome obstacles, especially people who are the most marginalized. And uh, anyway, so, so I know that there are positive stories out there. And I think it's important that, you know, if we can all start publicizing the fact that this film that, that certainly wasn't touted as being, you know, the most likely to succeed in Australia was actually the most successful, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully people will take more chances here. I think that's a great point. And, and, and I think we have to understand that fundamentally the audience is a lot smarter than the people who fund pictures. <laughs> uh, yeah, this bottleneck is an interesting question because but you know, a film hits the screen and the magic starts to happen. But of course it had to get past everybody else and someone did have to but, invest but in it. But now given that it really is, as Mike was also saying, you know, it's it's a reactionary business. It's a business that reacts to what was successful last year or the year before. You know, this is something to promote and say, you know what? Look, <laughs> you know, turn the tables on the on the financiers yeah. and say, look what's successful. Native stories are, sic are 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 really commercial, and people want to see them. So, I, I Dawn. I wanted to ask a little bit about um, this really interesting intersection. I love a career like yours that is so much about, um, I think, the excitement of you know the the, uh, the production setting where you find yourself you know um, um, involved in Disney enterprises in various ways, but also involved with communities in ways that have nothing to do, I suppose, with Disney. You know, and bringing both of those to the table at all times, and um, the kinds of conversations and maybe the the evolution of the quality of conversation that may have occurred around native matters of concern in a setting like the, the Walt Disney Company, uh, as you've viewed it over the past 20 years and so forth. And I can't help wondering, you know, what must it have been like behind the scenes in the Pocahontas days? You know, the, the, the sorts of conversations that went down back then. I was really just enjoying this panel. <laughs> kind of just really listening and taking it all in. Um, it's interesting to work in the studio setting. I worked at 20th Century Fox before at Disney. But, you know, and I've gotten a lot of feedback over the years about how can you work there. And I always think about, if not me, then who? Mm. I may be the only voice in 175,000 employees. I may be and probably am the only Native American that really has a voice there. And I will say that, you know, there are challenges, but I've been blessed really to be able to affect change, whether it was a script they were working on or um, policies. And even within, like, say, theme parks and resorts all over the world, part of it was, you know, the Disney look. You've all heard of that. And we have long hair. A lot of our Native American actors have long hair, male and female. And that's not part of the Disney look. And I was brought in from a compliance issue about that. So it's really about uh, allowing people to be authentic. You know, and I'm sure, like, um, there's just so few people, a Native American or First Nations people that work in the studio system. You know, um, Gail or Renee, have you ever worked with anyone when you worked with studios? Have you ever dealt with a, a Native executive? Never. So for me, on the inside, um, I do what I can in my way. But as far as the community, I've always felt that if I were home on the reservation, I'd be doing my part. And this is my community. So whether it's you know being chair of the board of the American Indian Registry back in the day, and helping with you know the script approvals and casting for like Thunderheart, Last Mohicans. That was the way we could actually help tell the story as authentic as possible, even though it is um, non-native directed or written. But same thing with First Americans. A lot of you, First Americans in the Arts, came out of a need for recognition. 
You know, I thought that there were a lot of great stories, a lot of performances out there, writers, directors, producers, but they weren't getting recognition. So that was really where, you know, First Americans of the Arts came out of, was really trying to get recognition. And that, you know, we had award shows for 17 years, and I think that became a place, a one-stop shop, for people to come and really view all of our amazing talent. You know, if I could uh, add to something she said, I just came from New York and I had been asked to sit on a panel like this for the African American Women's Film Festival. And in my opinion, you know, they may have some uh, similar problems, but I think they're light years ahead of us in terms of amount of roles and depiction and just amount of content. Um, but they were saying that they had found solutions to distribution and just accurate content in general, um, not so much by the fostering of creative talent, which is important, but that seems to ha happen on its own, but the fostering of production executive talent, meaning uh, casting directors, agents, managers, um, people who want to work in bus the business of the industry. And, and they mention you know, some of their large um, series now that are on television and how those actually help foster other people into the business. And so there is something to be said for fostering your community from a business perspective, not just the creative perspective. And I don't know how you do it. I don't know. Uh, th th this is something that I've been sort of, for my whole career, um, uh, there are so many talented native actors out there. But um, the challenge that I'm always throwing out to my colleagues in the casting world and um, executives in the TV world is that consider them, bring them in. It doesn't have to be a native role. They can be a young mother, a, a lawyer, a doctor. You know, bring them in because I th I feel that once we have more voices or, or more faces in in the landscape of entertainment that's out there for people right now, the more audiences are going to want to see these movies that we're making that we can't get distribution for because it's something unfamiliar to them and their faces that are unfamiliar to them. So, I mean, I think that the next, the, the thing that I, th I keep wanting us to push through but we haven't quite yet is seeing uh, Native actors. I mean, there's been a few, Sheila Towsey, Adam Beach. There's been a few that have um, uh, had places in television that weren't necessarily a native role. And, and there's a few more now, but they, there's so many, so much more talent out there that could be utilized that isn't. It's such a fascinating contribution, what you've just said, as a matter of fact, because it could be a person playing a role that isn't necessarily native, but it's not necessarily yeah. not native either. Why not? Yeah. Whereas usually it's a much more programmatic thing when you bring in the the native actor to play the particular role and then to play it to a set of expectations. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think just like African American actors are present in every aspect of our um, television world, so can native actors be, so can Asian actors be. Do you know what I mean? Part of the problem and, and this gets a little political, which I don't like to do, but part of the problem is if you look up um, the percentage of Native Americans as we are recorded by the federal government, they only count those American Indians that are actually enrolled with their tribes, and it's something like two and a half million. Okay, well, there's a lot more people with Native American blood than that, and it was a system that is a very failed system, um, so you can't gauge it by that number, but when studios and marketing executives in, in entertainment look at that and say, oh, well, that's not a big enough group to, you know, why would we depict that because that's not accurate? You know, you wouldn't, unless you're in, you know, Window Rock where 95% of the population is Navajo, why would the doctor be, you know, native? That, that's sort of the mindset when they look at statistics. Unfortunately, that is the mindset, but that there's no reason why we can't keep pushing against that. Um, uh, very early in the series, like the first weekend of the series, so early October, one of our guests was Shelley Nira, who was visiting from Canada, and we've shown a couple of her works. Very wonderful films, very different from each other, and Shelley herself, really delightful. But before she left town, you know, one of the things she said when asked 
you know, what's, what are your general thoughts about this phenomenon in native filmmaking? She says, well, it's just, you know, my thought is that people don't want these stories. I make them, I want to make them, but people don't want them. And it was a really interesting, you know, slightly sad um, uh, intervention that she made. But it made me think, you know, well, there's, you know, you're, you're dealing with entertainment and film and so forth. And you're also dealing with the world that people live in in society. And um, that you have a slowly unfolding story of the situation of the, of the figure of the native person in, you know, this American history and so forth. But right now, you're also seeing these really interesting and very, very successful stories of trauma about African-American themes and so forth. Very celebrated, award-worthy, you know, and so forth. And it's kind of come around that way for some communities more than for others. And I wonder if, if taking a longer view of history, somehow this makes it seem perhaps somewhat more possible that there could be breakthroughs of this kind and that this would be a film somebody would very much well, want to well, see. Uh, you know, it's funny because when, when you were reminding me of the year that Standing Bear was finally acknowledged as a human. That was after the Emancipation Proclamation. It was after, you know, w so it's, it, it really is. It's, it's, it is surprising, but, but maybe, you know, I, 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 it, takes w it takes one film. I mean, after Dances with Wolves, there was a lot of discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so I so I think that I I think that it it literally comes down to one breakthrough that that changes the discussion enlightens people and um, you know and and brings all of this to you know beyond the entertainment pages but into the you know editorials and into the uh, front pages of of well you know. <laughs> Newspapers, whether they're online or I still read them in print, but um, I guess I'm minority. Well, I, I think a comment has to be made, and I'm going to make it, uh, being that I'm Native American, because it might be interpreted as being critical, but I, I think we just have to put it out there. I think one problem that we do have to look at, um, I work in ministry on reservations, and I can tell you that there are many things that happen on reservations still to this day. We have 60% uh, unemployment. We've got um, substance abuse is rampant in many situations. Um, incest, poverty, um, suicide. I mean, there's a lot of social issues. And, and, you know, my little ministry that we have tries to address some of that. And there are some very good groups. And the tribes themselves are trying to address it. But what we see, um, and, and I want to celebrate it, is, is a lot of anger coming out of those communities and, and the filmmakers want to put that anger into their film and you want to encourage art as a cathartic experience. However, some of the films we viewed, and, and this is a pattern that Don and I as producers when we get content in to look at have seen, it's so angry, it's hard to watch. And I'm not suggesting that films that are hard to watch aren't valid. However, I do understand that we're talking about asking questions um, and, and asking the industry to accept our films as in the mainstream media, sometimes we are our own worst enemy. And, and there are films that go to a point that makes the audience uncomfortable. And again, I know it's, it's okay to make an audience uncomfortable, but I just want us to also consider the message and the voice because we, we watched some films that we just kind of went, oh, Okay, you know, I'm not sure if that would be appropriate. Um, you know, there's just things that are um, part of our community that are unfortunate. But I think, a as a filmmaker myself, I've always feel that you can get a very tough and uncomfortable message, and it's out there, and it's okay to make people squirm in their seats. But I also think there's a way to do it, and part of that goes back to Joe, who can look at any story, and he doesn't mind um, if you're making the audience uncomfortable. But he wants to make sure you're doing it in a way that you're bringing someone along for the journey with that character as opposed to alienating the audience. And, and we, can't, we can't sell films that alienate audiences. I mean, it just doesn't work from a, whether you're Native American or Italian or whatever, you, you don't want to alienate audiences. So I don't know if, does that, does that make sense what I'm saying? It makes uh, perfect sense for me. Um, I remember having similar conversations with my African American young people, kids, more than a few years ago, sim um, maybe 20 years ago, uh, crossover we were calling it. Why not? Why isn't that character African American? And now it's this. Con that's why this is so important. Why? Why isn't that character Native American? Why would we even? You know, this, that, that's just who they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and 
you know, the number of co the communities, I, the outliers that I was working with, have worked very diligently to get to get get that working for them. That they're all of a sudden they're just there. They're appearing without any, you know, oh my God, that's a with a without the label. And the more I, the more, um, the more today we can make this conversation, and the more viable those those what you're trying to do is exactly the, the, the doorway into it. And then when we have a feature, and it changes minds, I mean, uh, so I, I again, I'm very optimistic because a, a number of the, the young uh, writers I work with uh, have that dream and have that passion. As you know, Smoke Signals still, still has so much um, familiarity and just it's such a Velcro effect. Everybody loves Smoke Signals and so forth. And I was so surprised to see on revisiting it this year that it was being marketed as the comedy that did such and such, you know, the comedy everybody loves. Oh, and I thought, great. I remember bawling my eyes out at Smoke <laughs> Signals. It was just like it was too much for me. I was completely overwhelmed. Um, but at the same time, yes, you know, you did empathize. You did kind of chuckle with people and kind of roll with, you know, um, you know, at different moments of the film and so forth, although there was death uh, and every kind of, you know, bad thing, you know, also going on. Um, because it was humanistic and, um, and there was room given for you to breathe and so forth, and that was the mastery of a great writer, Sherman Alexi, um, and, you know, a great director that also really got that writer and, and what was kind of the opportunity that there was in this film. But it's still so well, rare. If, if you look at the black community and their filmmaking journey or their whatever you want to call it, um, they really broke through with comedy, if you think about it. Comedy is a very uniting form of entertainment. And I've always said, you know, people don't understand uh, often that there is such comedy within our community. Our elders are actually really, really funny, and yet they put on that stoic face, you know, until they crack some inappropriate joke. But um, I would love to see more comedy. I really would. Yes, we did a a comedy program a few weeks ago. We had a whole uh, comedy program on a, I think it was a Saturday afternoon. And it was a great audience. And it just showed, I think there were seven pieces, some shorts and different um, length projects. But it was amazing, really, to see the breadth of the comedy and re just remember all of those great stories that were told and the filmmakers who did it. It really was extraordinary. And, and films and television aside, lest we forget, there's also... Um, Charlie Hill, you know, who, who both in films and just as a stand-up and so forth made such a great difference for so many people as a comic. There's probably plenty left we could do in conversation, except that we have some microphones in the audience, and if folks have questions for our panel, we can um, take some questions, too. <coughs> All we need is a hand, otherwise it's me. Well, I, I, I was thinking, just as a follow-up, Renee, something um, I forgot to ask before, which is the, maybe the different, the different things that occur in the casting process when dealing with a Native director that might not occur otherwise. Is there something that people say that they're looking for or something that you intuit that happens in terms of um, what seems to be the right choice for a Native-directed work? No, I, I wouldn't say that there's anything different between a native director and another director. I mean, they want the, the right actor for their movie. They want to be moved by that actor's performance. Um, so no. <laughs> to me, there's no difference. Um, uh, and, and even with the non-native directors that I've worked with on, on various projects, they, they hire me because they want a native cast. You know, and they know that I have to go and find them that native cast. And I take it as my personal failure if they go with somebody who's not. You know, I don't have any choice in that, but it's, you know, we, g my office kind of goes deep into the communities. Um, we just got off the road right now. We were on the road for five weeks going thousands of miles all over uh, the northern part of the US and Canada um, to the communities because I'm looking for native actors that can speak uh, particular languages. So I'm looking at native speakers. Um, but no, I, it, director is a director. He wants the best actor for his role. And do you think native actors here in Hollywood seem to have access to the agents and yeah, the managers? That's just what I was going to say, mm. because our casting, for mm. the most part, on The Walking Dead is completely colorblind. Completely. Yeah. 
And yet when I think about it, it's like, you know, if the managers and the agents are not working on behalf of their clients mm -hmm. and submitting them, mm -hmm. they're never going to get read. Well, you know what? I have encountered over the years, and I've spoken to people about this, um, agents who will only represent a Native actor for a Native role. You know, they don't submit them. They, they don't even fully across the board uh, represent them except for those niche projects. And, you know, that makes me crazy because it's like don't, don't waste that actor's time. Let them go get a better agent that's going to represent them across the board. Um, but uh, I know a bunch of Native actors that want to be in please, your show. Please, please. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon Bialy and Sherry Thomas are our casting yeah. directors. The, and, Absolutely. and they're fabulous. They can self-submit. Yeah. Okay. I'm serious. <laughs> Uh, th there's there's a little niche market of, of of native actors that are obsessed with The Walking Dead. I will tell you I that. I think everyone's obsessed with The Walking <laughs> <Yeah>. Dead. <laughs> even even the husband of an actress that I know is like, oh, I just want to be on The Walking Dead. <laughs> <laughs> but Renee, you know, it's interesting because a lot of us who kind of you know watch the landscape and follow our native actors, um, one of the greatest talents that I've ever worked with is Irene Bedard. Yes. And uh, she was nominated for a Golden Globe in Lakota Woman. She then did Smoke Signals, and straight off of Smoke Signals came into my film, Naturally Native. And as a director, I've worked with a lot of different types of actors, but she was one that just, she had so much going on underneath the surface. And a lot of it, I mean, her background is, is it was very challenging as, as a, a young woman growing up in Alaska, but she uses it in her craft. And I mean, it was just a joy to work with her. And I thought, she's on her way, you know, someday she'll be an Academy Award-winning mm -hmm. actress. And literally... And someday she still might. Still might. But her career, like, literally just, I mean, kind of stopped. Same with Adam Beach. But I mean, you know what? what? It's, you it's it? because, I, first of all, there aren't, uh, you know, there's not... not there's there the just role. aren't the roles for Native women. There, there's a ton of roles for Native men. And I, a ton, I say facetiously, but, you know, there's two, three to one men to women roles. Um, but uh, the other thing, uh, you know, and uh, uh, suppositioning is that Irene doesn't live here. She's not here. She doesn't go in. I mean, the roles she that moved, Irene... She because she wasn't getting work. Right, <laughs> but the roles that Irene is... Uh, I mean, for in my world, the roles that Irene is right for, she's considered for. Absolutely. I can't speak to what other people, yeah. you know... Um, if, 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 they, if her, her agents are good agents, they, they keep her on people's radar, I would hope. But, you know, yeah. it's hard to say. But it'd be interesting to get, if, if you formulate a snapshot, if we could somehow, of what uh, now, you know, with uh, considering the local industry or just the, you know, the, the, the mainstream industry, how um, Native people are involved as professionals presently, you know, as members of guilds, or they're very well organized, or their associations of, as there are for women and, and other um, minority caucuses and so forth. Irene is creating content now. She, she has her own production company. She is creating content. Yeah, and I'm just using her as an example, but I think it's the phenomenon that exists where she had this career going, and, and a non-Indian person probably would would have been able to then play any role, but she's mm -hmm. still pegged as only being able to play a Native American woman, mm -hmm. and the roles just weren't there. So, of course, she didn't continue to get bigger and better things, you know. It, um, but uh, I think I think what you just said is um, right. Um, I know Gail's very active with the Producers Guild. I'm in the Directors Guild, um, a as well as the Screen Actors Guild, and they do have a lot of stuff going on for minorities. Um, they don't have that much going on for Native Americans because we're such a small group, obviously, but I do think they have resources that we could sort of network with, too. What are those like? Are there, are there specific initiatives about, about you know, starting relationships or conversations? I've been to, you know, gatherings where they say, we'd like to introduce you to these five people who represent something or other, you know, and it's five people I might not have heard of otherwise. They have networking events, like the Directors Guild has a really strong initiative for women directors because um, you can maybe speak to it better, but the, the annual TV uh, report, card. report card came out. It was abominable. I mean, it did not, not get better. <laughs> <laughs> no, not on Gail's show, but it, it, across the industry, 
um, you know, you want to see an increase in roles uh, for directors a as well as actors with women and minorities. And I think it kind of went backwards. And so um, the guilds are there to try to help encourage hiring of women uh, directors and minorities as well as in acting roles and producers. And, and the Producers Guild has a diversity workshop, but now that I think about it, I don't know anyone who's on our board who or who heads up any of our councils who's Native American. So the representation and the connection, connection you have to, right. yes. Right. The connection isn't there to get the word out. And this diversity program is amazing. And the number of, of projects that come out of it that get funding mm -hmm. is remarkable. So, uh, so that's something we can do something about. <laughs> it, it, the, the Screen Actors Guild does have a strong Native caucus, um, and they have created a diversity workshop, which I'm, I've been part of. And we travel around the country going to different um, communities and putting on a workshop called the Business of Acting, mm -hmm. which gives um, Native people, or it, it's really open to everyone, but we target Native audiences, um, the, the tools that it will take them to be competitive in the workplace to audition, just to get seen. So um, I do know that the SAG Native Caucus is quite active. You know, the one topic we haven't mentioned um, that is, I think it's rare, but it has to be mentioned. Um, I've known two filmmakers, Sherman Alexis one and Victor Masayev, is that, am I, yeah, I'm not sure, um, who actually have said to me, we don't want to be a part of Hollywood. Um, because as Native people, we feel that we've been marginalized and stereotyped, and so therefore, we just don't trust those folks. And so, even though they want their films to be seen, um, we we none of us on this panel trust <laughs> trust those <laughs> folks. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you just ha you know you got it, but but at the same time, if you don't engage at all, exactly. you can't change. You can't change the system unless you, unless you at least try to engage, um, you know. And and uh, you know, I, I've certainly seen I've seen some positive changes, um, but but if you're if you're disengaged, you're you're not even at the table. Right. No, I agree. And I found it interesting when I was talking to Joe when he called me to say, you know, how can I be helpful on this panel? He then um, actually said that when he works with Native Americans and getting their script right and telling their story in a way that's compelling and engaging, it's no different. He's worked with Christians and gays and African Americans. It's the same problem. You've been marginalized or stereotyped in the industry as a certain, you know, people look at you in a certain way. And so now we need to tell your story in a way that's real and human and people can connect with it. It really doesn't matter that you're Native or whatever it is. That, you know, it, it's kind of and fundamental. No, it, it, exactly. It's fundamental. Yeah, they, I, I, are they still using the term crossover? I mean, I, I, if we, I always put, we, if somebody was writing a, 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 a oh, if somebody was writing a, uh, thank you, um, a, a romantic comedy, why not, you know, why not bring in a Native American as, as part of the couple? You know, just, just that little bit of crossover and make everybody comfortable. That's why the engaging, if you're not engaging, you're not at the table, and you crossing know, over works. One of the things, Renee, you touched on about Irene is I think the one thing that we haven't addressed is that as Native people, we do work in, or live in two worlds. So many times I've found opportunities, we've opened the door as for talent development programs, writing fellowships, directing. We'll get someone into it, a Native person, and then they disappear, or they go home for ceremony or they miss the culture of home. And a lot of our actors, Renee, I'm sure you run into this, where you have someone you think you can get into something, then you find out they're, on, they're back in South Dakota, or you can't find them. A lot of times you can't mm -hmm. find them. So I think that's something that not every community works with, mm -hmm. is that there's that pull of the culture at home you know, and sometimes, well, you know, my grandmother told me to come home. So you, you know, go I, home. I, yeah. I've worked with Cliff Curtis, and Cliff is is Maori, and and he lives in New Zealand, and he goes back to New Zealand, um, and now you have the opportunity, even if you don't go in on an audition, you can put yourself on tape, right. 
and you can upload it to the internet, and the you know casting directors can mm -hmm. can send it out. But so you know maybe I, you probably do this is teach people how to do that. That's exactly what I do. Yeah, um, and I kind of encourage people to live where they love, live where their heart is, and do the do the acting thing um, when you need to, and when the opportunity is there. Because otherwise, I mean, it's, people can come to this town and be extremely miserable, and then they can't do good work. So um, I, I, I'm just as happy to go chase somebody in South Dakota if I need to. And But the, the thing is that they have to develop the tools to let the rest of my colleagues know where they are. And, and they have to develop the tools to be able to be competitive when they send in that audition tape. And that works for actors, mm -hmm. I think, but to work, say, in the studios mm -hmm. or to actually be, to be in the guilds, to actively be on a diversity council, to actually have a voice, you really can't live in the middle of North Dakota and have that voice, that presence. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we lack, mm -hmm. to actually be in the room. And, and, and I was interested in this. I don't know if we'll get to this snapshot because I don't know if any of us has it, but of, a, of an infrastructure of friends and associates and professionals and so forth who are there, you know, kind of advocating and because it's just the natural thing to do that native themes should be part of the larger conversation of just American discourse, you know, how we talk to each other in entertainment and in every way. But are we any place close to that? Well, I think what we have to do is we have to find those that are sympathetic. It doesn't have to be another Native person because that person doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We found uh, Christopher, Chris Davidson, right, at CBS, and he was in charge of diversity, and he really tried to get some of our films. He tried to get First Plant greenlit. Now, he was a gay man. Or he is a gay man. And he, but he connected with us because he understands what it's like to be marginalized and stereotyped. And so he came out and saw uh, True Whispers at one of our film festivals. And after that, he called us in. I mean, if we had had something that had been right for CBS at that point in time, we would have had that opportunity. We, we got the access because of him. So I think you can find those people in the system that understand who we are. They don't have to necessarily be Ponca, you know, but it's hard. And, and how do you connect with those people, I think, is still a question. I think you connect uh, emotionally in the heart. I mean, I meant logistically. Well, e yeah. even, uh, but still, but finding that guy, yeah. you know, I mean, there was a connection that had, he certainly wa was a business connection. You know, there was a larger connection as well. And he was, and he was, uh, and I remember that he was willing to, s to lend a hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's part of who we artists are, lending each other the hand. That's mm -hmm. co constantly. Totally. There really are no questions from the audience. You all came out on us. Oh, there's a question. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Tell us who you are. We don't really want questions from the audience. <laughs> <laughs>
Joe Early started as my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> So, so television, as compared with the feature film, as maybe the, as the future of this conversation. I've actually done a lot of television movies and miniseries that are native themed. So I do. I mean, almost equal parts film and television. So uh, there is a presence there. It's just um, uh, not a weekly presence. That's what we're saying. It's very, very hard to get a. Uh, I've actually been part of a team that's pitched uh, a native-themed TV series to people like DreamWorks, you know, um, and it's very difficult to get any series, not just a native-themed series, in the pipeline to go someplace. So, I mean, I'm just fighting the fight to get the actors on the established shows right now, and that might lead to you know, somebody saying, hey, what a good idea to do a native theme series. Uh, just to clarify in response to your question, I don't think anybody here was talking film as opposed to television. We're all talking various forms of visual media. Well, I, I think, you know, this particular series did take a look um, at everything. Most, most of it was film, uh, but we, we didn't restrict it. But I will tell you, it's a lot easier to, if you have a passionate s screenplay or script and you want to make it, you can actually make your own film and then try to find distribution. It's a lot harder to get, like, like Renee said, to get a series, and maybe Gail should take this. Gail, I don't know if you, I'm sure you all know, but Gail has the number one series on television right now, and I'm sure she can speak to how difficult that is. You don't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to get the... Uh, uh, I, I've there. pitched three native-themed <laughs> TV series and was unable to get traction, to even get a script written. Mm -hmm. I know a few years ago when I was working with ABC Talent Development, we were giving the realities, just really talking about, you know, getting something on a network TV. And the numbers were like, they heard 400 pitches in one season. And that's the ones that got in the door. They actually heard 400 pitches, 32, only 32 went into development, nine made it to the screen, one made it to the next season. That's reality. And so for a native um, filmmaker, you're up against a lot of odds. And that's that's just one of the networks, but those are real numbers. You know, the, but the interesting thing, I mean, the I think, and you know, the ABC uh, writer, diversity writers program, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but there is there is a fantastic thing, which is that um, most of the, mo the networks and then the major studios that fund, um, that fund the deficit for, for TV productions have a diversity workshop. And so it, this is for writers, and um, and they pay you while you're learning the craft, and then they staff you. Especially ABC's unbelievable, and boy, do they deserve a lot of credit for this. Um, they staff you on one of their shows, um, 
and literally, and they pay your salary while you're on the show. So you are you are literally guaranteed that you're going to be on a show. And I, the, I think the success rate must be 90% of the graduates of the Writers Diversity Program becoming established television writers. Um, and, and this is where I think those voices will come from. You get fantastic, trained storytellers who then have the credibility and the passion to tell these stories. Um, and you know, and someone might, might take, a, might take a, a chance on them, but, but that's something that I think is probably underused in the Native community as well. I'm sure that you're fighting to get those voices in the room too. Yeah, there's been some successes. Uh, there's a young writer named Sierra Ornelas. She came through the writing program. She's on her third ABC show right now. She was on Happy Endings. She's actually in the writer's room and really, really well thought of as a young woman. Do you remember April Fitzsimmons who came over? She just went through the program and she staffed on her second show. Well, I went through the Fox Diversity Writers Program, um, but I, I will tell you it's a great, all of, the, all of them, they're a great program, but what Mike was talking about, you know, writing a film that you're passionate about, telling your story, getting your voice out, that is, is really not what's gonna happen if you're a TV writer. You're there to write into a series that has already been formulated, and you might be able to, you can, might be able to do what Renee's talking about. You might be able to write in a native doctor that comes into Law and Order. Um, but I think the reason we may have been leaning towards film, even though I agree with you in terms of numbers, if we wanna tell stories from our community that educate audiences that are really stories from our heart that we're passionate about, like the human rights story, that's probably going to be more of a film genre. So I, I think that's kind of why we're leaning there. Yes, we can um, try to get writers into the system of, of television series. I think it's a longer road. I think you know we can we can do more immediacy in terms of film. That would that's just my personal opinion. It's a great uh, it's a great um, intervention though to say you know like there there's plenty to hope for and and plenty of of, of um, angles to work from by way of building an entire edifice that's working, that's firing kind of on all systems, yeah. that the right people are there, the right thinking is there, there's a track record, there's something now to respond to and repeat, and, um, and uh, from which to grow. So um, thank you for one really great question. Thank you, guys. <laughs> and thanks everybody, too. I, we're at time right now, and I want to thank the audience as well for, 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 for being here for, well, I think what has been really a very fruitful and historic conversation and uh, I, I was somewhere along the way, I was reminded of a conversation I had some years ago when um, an inconvenient truth was in theaters. Mm -hmm. That uh, my friend says, you know, you can be the president, the vice president of the United States, and have the, you know, the ear of the world. But if you could just have a Hollywood movie, then you <laughs> might be able to get something done. I thought, well, how true that is, because think of the conversations that have started in the aftermath of that one movie. So uh, if we can hope for something like that, then when we, when we see it happen together, maybe on that scale, we can all come together again and celebrate here in this room, I hope.